I remember when I was a child, my family didn't travel much abroad. And I remember the feeling after each summer break when my classmates came back and they had all these fantastic stories to tell. They'd been at sandy beaches, they had been visiting cool places with camels, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I was a little bit jealous, I have to say. Then suddenly, one day, my father came to me and said, we were going to go on a trip and we were going to go to Spain on a charter. And I was so happy. Finally, I was going to get the same experience as all the others. I was so excited. We went there. Unfortunately, I caught a stomach flu, which kept me in bed most of the week. But I was happy enough to have some spare time so I could go down to the beach and take a few snapshots. So coming back to Sweden, I could show my snapshots from Spain, and it looked sort of like the snapshots my friends had in their photo albums. And there I started thinking a little bit about that. So if my crappy trip could give me as good snapshots as my friends, how were their trip? And what did we really see when we traveled, right? So I started thinking about that and realizing sort of that we use these photos and snapshots to sort of create these fairy tales, happy moments that are sort of true, sort of not. And we all know, if you look at your own country, you know there's a wide diversity between people. You have rich, you have poor, you have all these different kinds, and you would never accept someone to stereotype, talk about stereotypes about your country grouping it all into one country stereotype. But we do that all the time when it comes to other countries. We group it and people in other countries tend to be like fairy tale, like fairy tale characters to us. And we think that's fine and sort of, yeah. But if we want to understand the world, we need to treat their countries just like we treat ours. So we get the same level of detail. So I remember when I was at school, my teacher used the world map to explain how people in other countries live. And that is sort of okay, but it, you don't really understand the living conditions. What we need is a socioeconomic framework, and that is currently missing. But there is a huge problem. We need to use statistics. And we all know what people think about statistics. They hate it, usually. We use photos as illustrations to create these fairy tale stories about our lives. But maybe that is not the best way of doing it. What if we could use photos as data? So I decided to start a project called The Dollar Street. And imagine the world as a long street. You have the poorest to the left, the richest to the right, and everybody else live in between. Something like this. The house numbers represent the income level you have. And where you live, you will find neighbors from all over the world. The interesting part would be if we could visit families, right? And see what it looks like in different homes. Because in each block, you will find people from all different countries, all different regions, and all different cultures. So I sent out photographers across the world to do home documentations, and I'm going to show you a little bit about that. What is a home? Well, a home is the place where we eat, go to the toilet and sleep, but we do quite a lot of other things as well. And these are the categories the photographers capture in each and every home. 135 things they capture by photo. Every home they visit, they spend about a day. So to take all the snapshots, to get the questionnaire filled out about the household and the family, and to take some video snapshots following the family and their daily activities, they spend a day there. And these are the families we have currently visited. It's 168 families spread across 37 countries. And we can see now we are in the upper corner of the Dollar Street among the richest. And now, we move down and see here are the families. 
So to show you an example, this is the Lama family in Nepal. These are the pictures we captured in their home. And here's the wall. This is one of the snapshots from their home. And what we can do then, since this wall is tagged by income, we can compare it with other walls like this. And we can see how walls differ across income. We have the poorest wall to the left and the richest to the right, and we can see how they look a little bit different and it gradually improves. But not all things are good to capture by photo. Some things works better on video, like activities. So I'm going to show you an example of that, toothbrushing. We start at the top. So when the photographer asked this woman, where is your toothpaste, because he needed a snapshot of the toothpaste, she pointed at her wall. This is not only her wall, it's also her toothpaste. So if we recap of the toothbrushing category, we can see that at the lower end of Dollar Street, you don't have a toothbrush, maybe a stick. As you come up, you start having toothbrushes. And when you come up to the richest part, you start having one each. So now we have an idea about what we're going to capture in these, all these countries and all these homes. But what we need is to define a, a first set of homes so they are proportional to the world population. We start by doing 100 homes. So we look at the world map, we can see 59% of the world population are in China and, and the rest of the Asian countries, meaning we need to have 59 of the homes from Asia. Then when we look at income, we can see the income spreads like this. These are income mountains, you can say. And you see how they spread, you transform it into houses, you put them on the street, and you can see there's a huge density in the middle, and they are spread out. So to make it easier to understand, we can take an example. Let's look at US. These are the US homes, the five green ones. And that there are five, then means that US is 5% of the world population, more or less. This is the income mountain of US. If we look at this family, this family is a representative for the richest 20% in the US group. And here's their home. The name is Howard's. And we can go inside and we can see all these 135 functions and we can see them brushing their teeth and washing their hands and so on. But it doesn't really make sense just looking at one home. It's when we start comparing we learn things. So we add this woman as well, the family Hadleys. They are in the poorest, quintile, uh, the poorest uh, house down here. And we can start comparing. So I would suggest we start by looking in their cutlery drawer. And if we do that, we can see there's a huge difference. She stores her in a green box, while the others has a like, really luxury box. You can see they even have a small box within the box for the tiniest uh, silverware. We now see the two extremes. And we always hear about there's a huge gap between the poor and the rich and so on, and that's true. But looking at the income mountain we see in the middle, we see most people actually live in the middle. So it makes sense to add one more cutlery drawer. So we do that, and we can see that there is a gradual improvement. And we can do that for other aspects as well. Looking at the kitchen sink or the living room, we can see a gradual improvement. Of course, we can do this for many countries. If we do it for China, for instance, here, three homes, three families. We see their house type. We see the sofas they are using, and we see the stoves. As you can see, there is a huge variety within a country. So using country averages is sort of a stereotypical way of explaining how people live. And we know, we've heard many times, that the US is richer than China, and that is true when it comes to averages. But if we put them on top of each other, we can see that the overlap is quite big. So the exciting part here, I think, is using the Dollar Street framework to start looking at neighbors and comparing there. So let's go visit these two families. 
It's the Wu and the Howard. And see their kitchen. The standards are sort of the same. Look at the place structures, identical. And the beds, sort of the same. Of course, we can do this in the other end of China as well. So we go down to this woman we saw previously, and we look at her neighbor. It's a family from Nigeria. So let's see what they have in common on that income level. Well, it's the Liang and the Al Burjoy. They have the same type of roofs and ceilings, constructed by natural material with plastics on top. The same type of chairs. They store their grains in the exact same way. Both are having fish for dinner, and they boil their water on identical stoves. So if we were visiting this Chinese family, seeing that stove, I think we might draw the conclusion that we learned something about the Chinese culture. But when you see them next to each other, you sort of realize this might not be culture. Maybe this is rather an income question. So by using photos as data, suddenly country stereotypes fall apart. So what we're planning to do with the Dollar Street Framework is to create an infrastructure where you can contribute with homes. Because we want it to be possible to compare all nations, all cities, and even all suburbs to see the diversity within the world. And it's when we can start comparing across country borders, we start to see interesting patterns. These are my main photographers, and without them, we would have had nothing today. They had been really hardworking, and I'm so happy. And when I'm looking through the material they've sent me, they, now I have more than 30,000 photos to go through. So it's sort of a task to bring some order into this. But going through it, I've got some first like insights that I would like to share with you. And remember, it's early in the process, work in process, so it's quite rough, but I think it's worth sharing it. So first of all, remember that this is the world population. Most people live in between. Stop thinking about the poorest and the richest, okay? Imagine that you were one of the three billion people in the middle. What would your life look like? Now, maybe it would look something like this. When you go to bed in the evening, you brush your teeth with the same toothbrush as the rest of the family members, and you're dreaming about the day when you don't have to share the toothbrush with grandma anymore. You go and lock the door using the padlock, and then the light might be flickering because the electricity is unstable. Sometimes you have to rely on moonlight if you want to read in the night. You get into the bed together with the rest of the family members, and at least you're happy you're not sleeping on the floor. Your house has a patchwork roof, so if it's raining, you will get wet and cold while in bed with the rest of the family. When you go to the toilet, you're at least happy, even though it's smelly and full of flies, you're happy that you have something that keeps your privacy, some kind of wall, so that you don't have to use the field or a bush. And then you go and, and grab water for preparing for breakfast. You have to walk for a bit, and it's heavy to carry, but it's worth it, because you're going to get this dish, the middle one. And it's the same dish you have for all meals a day, all meals a week, most of your life. And you're dreaming about a day when your food can start to become something delicious, not only nutritious. So by doing this kind of comparisons, look at it. We can start getting a view about how the world is when it comes to home functions. And we don't even mention the countries here. It's sort of rough segmentations of how we organize our lives. So my vision is the Dollar Street will become a visual framework that we use together with the world map to understand the socio-economic reality of the world. So by using photos as data, we can finally understand how other people live without traveling. Thank you. <laughs>